Right, good morning guys, I hope you're well. Um, today I want to explore the untold environmental problem. We know a lot about meat and that impact, there's films and influencers and all sorts on that. We know a lot about plastics in the ocean. Um, but one thing I haven't really heard people talk about, and it's I've been putting it off really because it's really inconvenient for me, it's probably inconvenient for you as well, is flying. Um, depending on who I've spoken to, some people think it is the most pollutant thing that we can do, the easiest and quickest thing for us to change in our lifestyles. I don't know if that's true, but I did see a couple of articles recently. There's one Guardian article, which I'll link to you in the description, basically says that one short haul flight can mean that we emit more CO2 than somebody in the rest of the world might in a whole year. I also read somewhere in there, I'll see if I can find it, that the world can sustainably handle each of us doing one short haul flight every three years. And I've got a horrible suspicion that flying is, we've got used to a luxury that we can't afford. Thankfully, I also love road trips and train trips, but that doesn't quite get you to the exotic other parts of the world, which have been so good for learning and understanding, going to Cuba and Costa Rica. They have changed my life and whole understanding about the world. So as we're building this global hamlet, this global village of friends all around the world, sort of exploring, experimenting with a new form of global or earth first governance, and I'm currently thinking about how we do our Swirl Festival in November, it feels right to address this issue because it might change how we think about getting together and how we might have to depend more on the internet, not just to broadcast things like this, but to actually talk, to actually be together. I guess it's a bit of a brainstorm because I've already been thinking about it. I just need to bring it all into one place. I found a great tool the other day which I shared in the Corcovado network and I was quite surprised that quite a few of you in the network picked it up and started playing with it as well and it came out of Berkeley the tool is called the cool climate calculator the cool climate network please give it a go tweet me up your response it's not that I think it's right but what I know from business and running projects is that what you measure you manage and what that means is if you start trying to measure the progress of anything at all, you end up optimizing your life and resources to get better at managing it. So it doesn't really even matter to me whether this tool is correct or not. <clears throat> but like, just like Jacinda Ardern is moving New Zealand from measuring GDP as the success metric for the whole country, moving to well-being metrics, but in the same way, if we move from measuring success as an individual from what stuff we have or how much we can gain, this tool definitely gets you thinking just by interacting with it and playing with it. Carbon goes from this ephemeral thing into something that we can play with and you might come up with some ideas. No flights, a four day week and living off grid. What climate scientists do at home to save the planet? Yeah, four day week happy days <laughs> living off the grid happy days no flights not great the reason we're not talking about it is because it's bloody inconvenient i want to travel the world i want to buy a 60 pound return flight on easyjet upgrade to the front row for an extra 15 20 quid and turn up in a new country where i get to meet new people and learn something new it makes me a better person but I won't be a better person if I don't have any air to breathe. And Lord knows I can't take the heat either. So we've got to keep the temperature down. I've been thinking about this and I think often the solutions to our problems are difficult when we think about them individualistically. If we figure out what is each individual sustainable um, usage of all kinds of different things, it might be that we find, and maybe this calculator helps with that, that actually together as a group of 10 or 100 you end up with you know a sustainable balanced output keen to know if you've got any thoughts or if you've seen anything like that again just on Quora so no don't you know don't shoot me for this I'm just trying 
but apparently a tree can sequester one ton of carbon dioxide by the time it reaches 40, 40 years old. My little tool says that I emitted 24 tons of carbon dioxide last year. I would need to be planting 25 trees a year to offset that, but the benefit <laughs> it would take too long. I guess the problem with planting trees is they probably don't sequester much carbon in the first 10 years, 20 years, anyone know the answer? And I guess we don't really have that time. I also just read a paper by the Extinction, Extinction Rebellion guys called the Civil This Civilization is Finished by Rupert Reed and Samuel Alexander. I read it in an evening. It was good. I'm not sure it said much new. Again, it's good to remind ourselves of the urgency that some feel, even though I don't feel it every single day. Last year, I did get paid by Airbus to go to the Farnborough Air Show. One of the things they showed me, I'll bring up the clip, is they're looking to put one electric engine in their plane. And then, I guess, a few years after that, it might be two, might be three, and then it might be all four as electric engines. But again, that feels a little bit like the tree solution, which is, yeah, if we manage to stay alive for the next 20 years, then maybe that'll work. Look, if I, basically, if I'm not going to feel guilty about taking 10 or 100 times more than my fair share of stuff, I need to know that what I'm putting back in the pot is either an agreement with someone else not to do that, in which case I owe them something else, or what I'm investing is going to create carbon or ecological returns within an appropriate time frame. So for example, if I planted a tree tomorrow that could magically sequester 25 tons of carbon within a year, then great. Use all the carbon I want. As with all things, it's like, well, this is all very good and well, but where do we go from here? And it is easy for me to say because I've already traveled a whole bunch of the world. It's a bit like when people have a go at China for emitting loads of pollution in factories. And it's like, well, it's easy for America to say that and the UK to say that because we've had our run in the sun. And now we're just saying, oh, can you guys just not do it? And if you're 18 or 21 and you're watching this video and I'm saying, guys, just, you know, just just go to Italy every three years on the plane. Well, that's easy for me to say because I've I've had a go at all of that. I'm a bit mindful of that. However, we do respond to incentives. And I wonder whether a really good simple rule, could be a really good simple rule, is are you willing to put the same amount of money you're putting on your plane ticket into capturing carbon? Because I think when you do the carbon calculator, it comes out at, well, maybe we can, carbon calculator, even just to Amsterdam. I flew to Amsterdam earlier this year. So it says my total, you know, emitted just for flying from here to Amsterdam was 0 0.06 metric tons, right? So I'm now clicking the offset now button. It costs $7.81 to offset each ton of carbon. So in theory, if I emit 25 tons in a year, that's only like $200. That doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't sound even nearly enough. Let me just see on EasyJet, for example, how much that flight is. To Amsterdam, Amsterdam. Wow, cheap. If I wanted to fly to Amsterdam this week on EasyJet, it would cost me 80 pounds. And I ask you the question, what if we were prepared to put the same amount as our ticket price into the eco pot? Planting trees or doing something to offset or sequester carbon, you may have a better solution than what I've been talking about on this call. Who does all the flying? According to the HuffPost, fewer than 18% of people have flown. So although yes, it is difficult for people that need to see family members and such. Most of my travel isn't like that. It's because I want to. Most of the time when I'm flying, 
if I wanted to pay the price, I could pay double the ticket price. But it might make me think twice about whether I nearly I need to go on the trip or whether I need to go by plane to go on the trip. Trains are pretty cool. They're not cheap, but they are pretty cool and they are much, much better for the environment. Maybe putting the same amount into the ecology that we put into our own air flights might be a good action. We manage what we measure, so it's worth trying this cool climate thing out. And something easy the airlines could do is make it standard, almost opt out for that to happen on their websites. So if you work for Virgin or BEA or EasyJet, why can't you automatically add carbon capture at checkout and make us opt out of it? Like they did with donors when you donate your organs. We saw a massive increase in organ donation because we made it an opt out rather than opt in. It's really, really simple behavioral economic things like that that can totally change behavior. So that's something that the airlines can do without it actually costing them any more money. Although obviously some people might not buy the flight, that's true. But you should do it anyway, because it's your responsibility. We don't have 20, 30 years. If we do, then we just plant some trees and fingers crossed and have that techno hope that everything will sort itself out and Airbus will get their plane, their engines green in time. But I'm talking one to five years. You know, if I'm using too much stuff, how can I nullify that in one to five years? That feels fair, given the environment that we're in. If you know better solutions, please, please let me know. My default this year is that I'm going to try, I think we need to try and gather the global hamlet into small, road. maybe we need to be a road trip gang. We need to be able to travel decent distances to get together. And maybe if I am going to travel more than short haul, maybe I need to think about doing it all in one big round the world flight and making five or six stops rather than doing six individual return journeys throughout the year. Any other ideas you guys have got, please let me know. And let's be honest about the hassle and the hustle and the challenge of it all. If you can afford to do it, who doesn't want to fly other than if they're scared of flying? It's brilliant. It's amazing. I love it. It's changed my life. And aside from getting the free drinks and the three films in a row, the perspective it gives you, the people that you meet, it's, it's in a way, it's everything that life's about. So that's why I think this is an important conversation. Um, this is just a little exploration and a chance for me to try out some of this podcasting gear. I'm keen to know what you guys think. Please, please, please link lots of stuff in. If you want to talk more about it, go into the Corcovado network, corcovado.mn.co. Yeah, tweet me up or Dave Rasmus one on Instagram if you do the cool network chart. It really doesn't matter where you're starting. Please don't think it matters where you start, but we measure so many things in life. Instagram followers, our weight, um, money in the bank. But what if we measure our impact, our footprint? And this is not a bad tool to start with. I'm trying to focus the questions on the things that matter and especially things that are relevant to our global hamlet. If you don't know what the hell I'm talking about with the global hamlet, go see my talk, which is at Thinking Digital in May. And um, join the Corcovado Network if you want to know more. See you soon, guys. <laughs>